you because you're not everything you could be. And so, you know, you should work on that before going and telling someone else that maybe they're not who they should be. So I think it's, you know, I, so I don't buy it. It's too easy. It's far too easy. And it's too public. And it's too self-congratulatory. And then there's the murderous, like Marxist telling you, which, you know, I'm always often inclined to mention. So certainly, I think you've identified certain causes where the public element or the self-congratulatory version of Google could be harmful. But do you think there are cases, for instance, I'm thinking of policy, influencing policy, being a policymaker. It seems like something like that, public policy, could be used to eliminate some unnecessary suffering, but would involve a more public domain, something where you are trying to attract followers, trying to attract praise from other people. Look, look, if, you, if you've established yourself in the world as a credible human being, and people are asking you to enter public service because of your accomplishments, then it's time to do it. Right. But before that, it's a little on the premature side. Mm -hmm. And if you're just setting your for self forward as an avatar of an, ideo of an ideology, then there's nothing to you except I think of it as the chattering of various forms of demons. It's like you're not helpful. And if you if you look, you want to think, okay, are you fit to lead? Yeah. Let's let's put it that way. Okay, first of all, do you know where you're going? Because that's actually one of the hallmarks of a leader. The leader knows where he's going, and maybe other people are also interested in going that way. But the leaders I've met have carved themselves out a personal vision. Right? It's not some it's not some cookie cutter ideological solution to the ills of the planet. They've done a detailed analysis, right? They know what they're talking about. And they're usually people, well, they've had a successful relationship. They've had a successful family. They have a couple of degrees. They've established a business. Like, they've made themselves credible in five or six dimensions. Well, then maybe you know enough about the world to dare to mess with its internal mechanisms. And if you, if you don't have that kind of in-depth knowledge, then you should just, you shouldn't, you should no more work on the economic systems of Western civilization than you should try to adjust the electronic systems of your automobile because the latter is far less complex than the former. So of course there's utility in policy formulation and in, in government service and in all of those sorts of things. But you have to you have to have transformed yourself, at least to some degree, into someone who's actually competent before you should even dare to do such things. You think, well, I've read some Marx and now I know how to change the world. It's like that, that's a very bad idea because yeah. the probability that you're going to take something complex that doesn't work too badly and fix it with your idiotic intervention is zero. Mm -hmm. So, well put. <laughs> <laughs> You talked a little bit about this idea of signaling virtue. And one thing that I thought about, a lot of activist causes, ones you might characterize as self-congratulatory, seem to emphasize concepts like validation and affirmation. In your experience, either as a professor, as a psychologist, do you think that this is an example of virtue signaling and perhaps provide like a definition of virtual, virtue signaling first? Or do you think there is some value in these types of principles or these types of interactions? I don't think there's any value in those principles mm -hmm. at, at all. I mean, I can say, well, I think you're a really good guy. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. Dr. And I mean, no, at, at, at most, that's, uh, well, first of all, it's cheap and easy. That was easy. <laughs> I mean, and now I'm a, I'm a good guy because, you know, I'm perfectly willing to affirm you. It's like, mm -hmm. everyone has a problem, let's say, with self-affirmation. This is why mm -hmm. I hate that word, but I'll use it temporarily. Um, this is part of the reason why I'm an ad admirer of part, in part of the existential philosophers and psychologists. Because one of the points they made is that, well, human beings are flawed creatures. We, we have tragic lives, we're very, very vulnerable, and so it's very easy for us to despise ourselves and to, and to, and to, and to, be, and to despise and have contempt for humanity itself. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons for that. We're, we're weak, we're flawed, we're malevolent, we don't last very long, we're not very attractive, we have, we have an endless litany of faults, both as a species and as individuals. Well, so, so you're stuck with that, that's just part of being itself, it's built into the fabric of being. So what do you do about that? Well, you don't go around waiting for someone to tell you what a you know, good person you are, that's not, first of all, it's not believable, it's not helpful. That doesn't mean you should be 
tormenting people into a sense of even more fallibility than they already have, that's not, clearly that's not helpful. But the way that you develop a, a, a sense of respect for yourself, which is a better way of thinking about it, or respect for humanity for that matter, which is much better than thinking about it as an affirmation, mm -hmm. is to bear up under the damn load. And then you can recognize yourself as something that's flawed, but that can tolerate the flaw, and that can work towards alleviating it. And that's, that's the pathway to the transcendence of tragedy, which is a much, like, compared to affirmation, it's like, it's... You're giving a starving, you're giving a thirsty person dust to drink. There's nothing to it. You know, people, people have to commit to being in order to withstand their own vulnerability and fragility and, and essentially flawed nature. Mm -hmm. The way that you tolerate that is to, the way you stand up underneath that is to adopt responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. And then your pathway is clear. Then you can tolerate who you are. Mm -hmm. And then you won't hate humanity because people hate humanity. You hear the environmentalists, the radical environmentalists say such things. I've heard people say this. The planet would be better off without people on it. It's like, well, let's keep you away from the hydrogen bombs, <laughs> shall we? You know, and people think that's a virtuous statement. The planet would be better off without people on it. Like, really, that's, that's what you're saying. It's like, I see, you don't think it's okay to be racially genocidal, but it's perfectly fine to just wipe out all of them. That's okay, as long as you're not selective about it. So, we, we, we're, we're, we're nourishing people, we're nourishing young people on nothing. It's nothing. It's like they're suffering, and no wonder, because life is suffering, right? That's the first thing you learn if you're on the road to wisdom. Life is suffering, right? And is it someone's fault? Yeah, sure, it's society's fault, it's your fault, it's nature's fault, it's God's fault. It's like, yeah, the fault's everywhere, man. So what are you gonna do about that? Bear up under it and do something useful. And then you can respect yourself, at least to some degree. At least you're not contributing to the problem. Yeah. You know, and then maybe you can start to see the beauty in life and the possibility in life and the majesty in life and the, and the, and the in, incredible capacity of human beings for self-transformation. Here, here's an example. We've, we've learned this relatively recently in, at a neurobiological level. You know, so you know, there's been an idea, a psychological idea, floated around for quite a long time, a clinical idea that you expand your character by aggregating diverse experiences, right? It's sort of, you journey everywhere to become who you are. And you can think about that from, from a Piagetian perspective, a, a constructivist perspective, and say, well, the more places you journey to in the world, the more information you expose yourself to, and then you take in that information and inform yourself with it, and you, you develop yourself because you're more differentiated and you have a more differentiated view of the world. It's like the, the basic idea is the world is a pool of information that you can use to construct yourself out of and to construct the world. Mm -hmm. And that's a lovely doctrine and I, I believe it to be the case. Mm -hmm. But there's more to it than that. You know, we, we know now that if you take someone and you put them in a radically new situation that new genes turn on in their in their brain at the micro at the at the, yeah. at, the at the micro level new 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 genetic structures code for new proteins and build new structures it's like you're actually a pool of biological possibility and the only way that you can determine the full extent of that of that pool the possibility of that pool is by pushing yourself out against the world and that will physiologically transform you we have no idea what the limits to that are we know in clinical psychology that you know, what you do with people is expose them to the things that they're afraid of and are avoiding. You don't make them less afraid by doing that. You make them braver. That's why it generalizes, right? They don't come out saying, oh, the world's safe. It's like, once you've learned that the world is safe, not safe, there is no going back. That's the post-traumatic stress disorder conundrum. There's no going back. But what you can learn is, yes, the world is terribly dangerous, far more dangerous than you think. And people are far more malevolent than you likely have the imagination to to conceptualize, but there is way more to you than you know. Mm -hmm. And if you wouldn't look for safe spaces and retreat, if you would push out in the world and accept your responsibility and, and confront your limitations, then you would discover all sorts of things about you that you have no idea about. And then you would transform into something that's far more than what you are. And, and, and it's in that process of continual transformation that you'll actually find the essential meaning of life. So, and again, this is, it, it's not like, it's not like we don't know this. Everyone knows this. Mm -hmm. So, and the universities in some sense are supposed to remind you of this. 
but they've abdicated their responsibility as far as I'm concerned and in many cases are working counterproductively. They're trying to teach young people that they're, that they're helpless victims who need to restructure society in order, I don't know, I can't even say it anymore. It's so, it's so empty and dead. It's, 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 it's you know, I, I, I think I read this in, in uh, Elias Kennedy in a book called Crowds and Power. And it was one of the things that really stuck in my imagination. He did an etymological analysis of the word slogan. And he said that it was derived from the Welsh, uh, two words, sluag, S-L-U-A-G-H, and gherm, G-H-A-I-R-M, and it meant battle cry of the dead. And that really struck me, because I, I've, I've always had this sense that people mouthing ideologies are the puppets of corpses, it's something like that, the puppets of corpses of malevolent philosophers, you know, and they speak in dead tones, and they're not interested.